Hope everyone's having a good week so far. So let's jump right into the lesson this morning. And uh, I know sometimes it gets repetitive, but each week I got to start off with the kind of the same introduction. Uh, that way, no matter who's watching this online down the road, they're not get dis um, they're not uh, yeah confused about what's going on. We're continuing the series. Is it in there? Is it in there? Uh, the idea is that uh, some sayings that are used in churches all across America, as if they are biblical, but in reality, they are not found in the Bible. So Cindy asked, is it in there? Uh, do you think it's in there? Well, we're going to find out that it's not, right? Uh, the most uh, read book in history is also the misquoted book. And you think that if it was read properly, it would not be misquoted. But I think some people tend to read little cute devotions or things on Facebook or social media or in the internet or uh, news, uh, magazines, whatever. I remember the old uh, little uh, um, daily devotions you used to get. Sometimes they'd have misquoting on there, but uh, what's a little magazine everyone used to read once a month? And I always forget what it is. Uh, but anyway, it, it was it always had all sorts of little sayings, and cute little jokes, stuff like that in there. Uh, but they were always misquoting the Bible. And I understand that some of these are maybe rewardings of biblical verses, but it may not seem so bad, or there may be just a kind of a concept the Bible teaches, but not exactly word for word, that's we're going to look at one of those today. Um, and you're correct, but some of them are dangerous false teachings, or at least it is dangerous if you continue following down that path, because sometimes you got to follow the thought process all the way through. So remember in our Bible, we're looking at Psalms 119, verse 16, I will delight in your statutes. I will delight in your statutes, says the Lord. I will not forget your word, uh, says David when he's writing to God. So let's begin to speak truth from God's word over just tradition or what I used to think it said, right? So each uh, week we're going to look at a fun phrase and a, then a serious doctrinal teaching. And hopefully we can learn some biblical, wonderful truths. So here's a fun one. Is it in there? A fool and his money are soon parted. A fool and his money is soon parted. Well, it's not in the Bible. It is a wise saying, um, but it's not found in the Bible. It's derived from a poem by Thomas Tusser. Uh, the poem is called 500 Points of Good Husbandry, written about 1573. Um, and uh, John Bridges wrote um, in 1587, in defiance of the Church of England, he wrote the same thing. And uh, so, although not in the Bible, the principle is found all throughout the book of Proverbs. The drunkard, drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. Uh, he that has to be rich... Uh, hath an evil eye and does not think about poverty shall come to him. And so those are like Proverbs. And so it wasn't so bad, kind of a rewarding of some wisdom from Proverbs, but not word for word from the Bible. So the next one, though, can really throw people off, a uh, throw them off this kind of doctrinal path, a, a doctrinal truth, if not understood properly. We need a fresh anointing. We need a fresh anointing. This may not be as popular as some of the other phrases, we've talked about, but it's widely taught in many churches across the world. Some preachers speak about a fresh anointing of the spirit as it would be a, the answer to every challenge we face in life, or maybe the big breakthrough in life that we have been praying for. We need a fresh anointing. Similar to last week's, we need revival today. The problem with this teaching is that it implies that we lack something we still need from God to give us. If we're a believer today, we don't have all we need. We still need more from God. Uh, we need more, a fresh anointing. We need more of the Holy Spirit. We've only got like 50% of the Holy Spirit. We need like, you know, 75 and then we'll pray for 80 and then pray for 90. Like many of the other phrases we've looked at, this one sounds great on the surface, but ask those who say we need a fresh anointing, what exactly do you mean by that? And you discover that their view is inconsistent really with biblical teaching. Most people are referring to some additional empowering by God when they're talking about an anointing. It is as though God has supersized the power of the Holy Spirit within us. We have some of the Holy Spirit. We want to supersize of it. I do not mean to criticize people's sincere desires, but I, I do think that we need to correct misunderstandings like this. If not, we could slip further and further from the truth. So let's understand what this phrase is a little bit more. So what is anointing? It goes back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, an anointing was literally the act of pouring oil on a person's head. It was a symbol of God's appointment and an empowerment of a person to play a specific role for God. 
whether it's a priest or a king or some other special service. Remember that when we go a little bit further and we talk about today's uh, thought process, but remember that aspect. Aaron was anointed as a high priest when he the law of Moses began. The prophet Samuel was anointed Saul and David as kings. Uh, as the prophet Samuel anointed Saul and David as kings. Individual priests were anointed when they assumed their offices. Again, the meaning is the giving of authority and power to serve God in a special capacity. That's an Old Testament teaching. The ultimate anointed one is Jesus. In fact, Christ means the anointed one. Christ is his title. It comes from the Greek version of the Hebrew word Mashiach or Messiah, which means the same thing, the anointed one. That's why Jesus was making a messianic claim when he visited the synagogue in his hometown and selected a familiar messianic passage to read out loud to them. He read this in Isaiah 61.1. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news, right? The good news, the gospel, right? To the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And then after reading that to them, he looked up and said to them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears, right? Right before you, it's fulfilled. Here I am. Oh, the implications of this claim didn't escape the people who were listening. In fact, as Jesus continued, they were angered by what he said and rose up eventually to try to kill him numerous times because they realized that he was saying he was the anointed one, right? He was the Messiah. But what about us? Can we be anointed too? Well, of course. But we don't get oil poured, poured over us in that anointing. New Testament speaks very little of a spiritual anointing, but it does uh, say very state, very clear statements about what it does talk about. Here is the clear teaching. If you're a believer today, because of the presence of Christ within you, you already have been anointed. 2 Corinthians 1.21 says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and established the guarantee with a spirit in our hearts. First John 2.20 says, But you have, have an anointing for the Holy One, and you know all things. John didn't say that these believers needed it. He said they had it. He didn't say that they needed more of it. He said they had it all. And John is not talking about some special category of believers. But all believers. So the anointing back then in the Old Testament was you were anointed for a specific purpose. That person was set apart for this purpose. He was going to be the king. He was going to be the priest. So somehow people think that there's an anointing that goes on for specific greater purposes. Some people have a more anointing. Look at First John with me, verse number two. I have written these things to you concerning those who deceive you. Remember, he's saying you're, you're being deceived. By this teaching, isn't it funny that First John was written 2,000 years ago and we're still having the deception? Verse 27 says, But the anointing which you have received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. For the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And just as it is taught you, remain in him. So the Holy Spirit that's in the preachers are the same Holy Spirit that's in you. Right? So how do we understand this as one continuous thought? Well, Jesus Christ himself is the anointing of God. He basically asked those in the synagogue that day, do you want to see the anointing of the Almighty God? You're looking at him. The Holy Spirit of Christ who lives in us is our anointing. His life is inside of you at this very moment. And you have the anointing of Christ because of him. The anointing is a person named Jesus. And he never leaves you. Jesus, the Christ. Jesus, the Messiah. Please do not misunderstand me. Again, I don't want to criticize people's desire for themselves to be used by God more in his kingdom. It's a worthy desire to be mildly used by God. That seems to be the main thing people sometimes use when they say, well, I want to be anointed today. I've often had people pray for me and speak that I say, Lord, anoint him in a special way. I know what they mean, and so does God, of course, and I appreciate the prayer. And I know this may seem like semantics here. You know me, I like semantics. But unbiblical language can potentially bring about misunderstandings. For example, many believers have incorrectly thought that others, especially get the teachers, are anointed somehow, having something from God that the rest of us believers don't. 
they've had that special anointing by God, like we specially anointed the priests back then, we specially anointed the kings back then. They may think that anointing is for special believers who are a spiritually different level than the rest of themselves. Some people think that it's not for ordinary Christians. The Bible teaches exactly the opposite, though. The anointing is for every believer. In fact, it says, you know all things. You don't need someone to teach you. You already have it because anointing Holy Spirit is in you. The anointing is a person named Jesus, and he lives in you. Uh, the Bible says um, that, that you are anointed, and that's a fact. Now, you only need to act like you know what that fact is. When we know that we have the anointing of the resident Christ, Christ living in us, then we should live triumphantly, live victoriously, live as if we have the knowledge of Christ in us. God will live through us and people will be amazed. So you don't need to ask for a special anointing or think that somehow a pastor has a special anointing or you're you're watching uh, online uh, you know, messages or TV messages and you hear one guy that's really, really better than, than me, right? I'll just be honest. Right? And you're thought, oh, that guy is so anointed, right? Now, he may have a, a gift. He may have a spiritual gift, a uh, prophecy of proclaiming God's word, right? But the, the anointing is the same that you have. Church, if you're a believer in Christ today, um, there's a better way to say it. The better way could be, God, give us a remembrance or revelation that the anointed one that's living inside of us and allow us to see that truth and live that truth in our lives today. We will live that truth in our lives daily. So we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of Godhead deity in Christ, Christ the anointed one, the Messiah living inside of us, the Holy Spirit anointing is already there. If you have trusted Christ as your savior and he's living in you, you are a new creature in Christ and you are anointed in Christ. You don't need a fresh anointing because you have all that you need in Christ. You don't need a second anointing because you have all that you need in Christ. You just remember the truth that is in you. So say, God, rem remind me of that truth. God, show me that truth in my life. Show me that that's real in my life uh, through your scripture or, or through uh, uh, working through me. Amen? And that should be a woohoo moment, right? That should be an exciting moment to know that the Holy Spirit is in it. We don't need a fresh anointing. We have the fullness anointing. We don't need you know, an extra 10%, 20%. We have 100% anointed by God. We are chosen people. We are we are brought about to be his church, his family. And so remember that um, if you want to proclaim God's word, it's already there in you. You're reading God's word. Uh, honestly, you don't need the preacher to bring this out. You can read God's word and see it yourself. That's what the Holy Spirit in you is for. And so that's the, the exciting part about that. Amen. That's exactly what John was telling us. Let me pray with you this morning, church.